Good afternoon. Um, I'm Marc Fino from GCSP. I'm pleased to welcome so many of you to this uh, public discussion on the role of small states in the maintenance of international peace and security. I uh, would like to thank uh, the permanent missions of uh, Belarus, uh, Switzerland and Singapore for sponsoring this event <coughs> and offering such a uh, prestigious lineup of speakers. Uh, starting with um, Mr. Uh, Andrei Dabkunas, uh, is Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of uh, Belarus, Ambassador Sabrina Dallafior from Switzerland and Ambassador Foucault Dui from Singapore. Um, we'll only have, as you know, a very limited time, so I will um, skip the, the presentations. You all have the detailed, uh, impressive uh, CVs of the speakers. And we'll start with a, a short introduction from a conceptual point of view, a more an academic point of view, by my, my colleague uh, from GCSP, uh, Jean-Marc Ricli. And, and then we'll move to the views and experience of the practitioners. So Jean-Marc. Good afternoon. Right, uh, I'm a bit the old man out in this panel because I'm not a practitioner. So uh, I'll try to provide you some conceptual thinking about small states and uh, how we think about small states. So in the literature for a very long time, we had to struggle on what smallness mean. And the first uh, idea that you can have about what a small state is to define it by its size. You said, well, a small state is, is a state that has five million or six million inhabitants. But obviously, it's uh, very arbitrary. And therefore, uh, through different uh, iteration, um, the so-called fourth generation of people thinking about small states came up with not looking at the concept of smallness, but at the concept of power. And uh, small states state is a state that has a deficit of power due to its limited ability uh, to mobilize which resources, which could be material, relation, or normative. And therefore, you shift the problems toward defining what power is. So power uh, is two things. is the ability to, uh, if you take a boxer, the analogy of the boxer, is the ability to punch, while at the same time to protect yourself. So if you translate that in terms of uh, a security posture, it's the ability to remain autonomous while uh, exerting influence. And so if you have both, you are able to uh, remain autonomous and um, exert influence, uh, you are powerful and uh, therefore you can, uh, you can uh, use uh, and apply offensive strategies. By definition, small states cannot do that. By definition, small states have to choose between either favoring autonomy, which will be a more defensive strategy, or influence, which is more about alignment. And what we've seen over time is that states are trying to combine both. This is what we call hedging uh, strategy, and I will come back to that in, in a second. So what are the, the different manifestation of this um, of these uh, strategic choices. Well, if you favor autonomy, uh, you very likely uh, uh, adopt a policy of neutrality, the one, that, for instance, Switzerland conducting during uh, the Cold War. The advantage is that you are self-reliant, but also if something happens, you will not be able to uh, rely on others to come and, uh, and help you. The other is influence, and that to have influence, you basically have to join an alliance, and this is for those who have studied uh, international relations, this policy of bandwagoning or uh, Balancing, and the idea here is really to tie your fate to a, gre uh, a greater power, but trying to influence this um, this uh, greater power. Hedging basically is a lighter version of influence, in the sense that you are diversifying your uh, alignment strategy through coalition, so it's less binding than um, than uh, alliance uh, strategies. But uh, uh, the problem is that uh, you are multiplicating the number of alignment and then sometimes can be uh, co uh, contradictory. So, in terms of uh, what it brings, neutrality will magnify your sovereignty and uh, the, what you have to, to prepare is to defend uh, yourself uh, on your own. And this is what Switzerland did during the Cold War by adopting a very autonomous uh, defense uh, policy. The risk is what we call strategic abandonment. If anything happened, um, uh, you are at risk to f think about uh, the, the, the neutrality policy 
of uh, Belgium uh, in the past, for instance. Alignment strategy, again, uh, you are relying on deterrence provided by grid powers, uh, in the case of NATO, for instance. Uh, uh, small states that are member of NATO can rely on uh, deterrence provided by uh, the United States. The problem is you are reducing your autonomy and therefore there is a risk of entrapment. If your uh, biggest uh, ally is decides to actually going to war, for instance, like the US uh, did uh, in 2003 with the war in Iraq, then there is a pressure for you to uh, contribute. Hedging, again, has increased a, a level of flexibility, but uh, the problem is that um, sometimes if you have too many, uh, you're in too many coalitions, then you might be actually become prisoners of the game of uh, the greater power. So. It, if you look at uh, the, this difference posture, um, this is the Cold War uh, smooth strategic posture. So you have neutral state, you have the allied state, Warsaw Pact, and, and NATO, and you have the non aligned uh, movement. Now, if we look at the evolution of four different expenditure to look at the transformation of the international system, what we're witnessing is that we moved from post Cold War environment, uh, a Cold War environment which was bipolar, to a post Cold War that you may make a point that was kind of unipolar, and now probably we're witnessing a transformation of the international system towards some would say it's a multipolar system, other would say it's an apolar system, meaning there is no state that, are, that is able to prevail across all dimensions of power. And this will have uh, influence on your alliance strategy. If you look, for instance, at a US defense expenditure in, in 2011, the US spent much uh, more actually than the third uh, 13 uh, followers. And in 2017, this dropped to uh, the uh, seven uh, most important uh, followers. So there is a sense that we are moving towards a more uh, multipolar uh, system and in each of the region, the main region, Europe, uh, Asia and, and the Middle East, we have champion. The Middle East, we have Saudi Arabia that increases dramatically its defense expenditure. In Europe you have Russia and obviously in Asia you have China, which means that the world is becoming, uh, will be defined by, m uh, regional security will be much more important. Thus uh, is the question where does your strategy a small state lies? A neutral uh, <coughs> a state strategy is uh, nowadays very difficult to, to, to conduct. And what we are starting to witness is that states increasingly are becoming part of an alliance or, d or become a part of different uh, uh, coalition. For instance, if you look what is going on in, uh, in the Gulf region, uh, the Gulf states for a very long time were really under the, um, the, the umbrella of uh, the United States. And this day, what you see since last year, for instance, with the Qatar crisis, you see that Qatar now is actually adopting a different policy because the region, the balance of power in the region is also changing. The US is not as prevalent as they used uh, to be. Russia now has become an uh, important actor. And my uh, predictions are always difficult to predict, but the future will we'll see more and more of this shift in uh, uh, alliances. I'll skip uh, this one, but for a small state, basically, if they want to prevail, uh, because of the structural uh, problem linked to power, they have to maximize the room of maneuver. And how do they do that? Basically, uh, you look at theories of negotiation, and basically negotiation is uh, meeting two, uh, two different interests. And you can negotiate when there is some overlaps in interest. And these overlaps create what we call this zone of possible agreement. So if you want to win a negotiation, what you have to do, you have to increase this zone of possible agreement. How do you do that? Well, you can leverage that by, and this is my argument, and when you are small, to focus your resources not everywhere, but in niche strategies. Why? Uh, first of all, what is a niche strategy? Is, a wa is one that basically maximizes your position domestically. It has to be accepted by the constituent of your state, but also it provides, it lowers the cost of alternatives internationally. And how do you do that? Well, <coughs> uh, you have different uh, ways to do that. And small states have been really good at investing in some uh, niche strategy. It could be technical expertise providing a know-how that uh, 
is not uh, very uh, common. For instance, uh, the time the Czech Republic invested in, in nuclear, biological, and chemical weapons uh, uh, materials, this is very much in need. And each time uh, there was a need for that, uh, people, would, uh, states would come to the Czech and ask for this. Norway, for instance, uh, invests in heavily in special operation forces, which were also very much um, uh, in need. Uh, a Swiss model has been, uh, for, especially for the neutral state, to be a honest broker. In a bipolar environment, there was a need for, some, for a state to actually be able to play the, the, the go between. In a multipolar um, environment, we'll increasingly need that kind of skills, states that are, or actors that are able to uh, broker uh, deals. Uh, some states, some small states, have actually uh, focused their uh, uh, policy on creating norms uh, because norms is, are not very difficult in terms of resources to create and can actually provide you with a lot of influence. And uh, some states, especially the Nordic states, for instance, have been very successful in doing that. Uh, other possibility is to create institution, institutional engineering. In an environment, think about the UN. The UN was creating for the post-Second World War environment. Current environment is completely different. So there is a need also to adapt our international organization institution to this new world. So a small state can contribute to developing that kind of institution. And by developing this institution, you are also provide, you are creating uh, you, um, some power for yourself, obviously, but also you're providing something for international uh, stability. And the last thing is, those for those states who are much committed into uh, hardcore military operation is to provide niche capabilities. I mentioned before uh, the Czech example or the Norwegian uh, e example. All right, so I stop there. Uh, that just fr um, uh, frame the, um, the, um, the the concept of what small city is all about. And uh, now I think we have we'll hear from more practitioners' view about uh, how to develop and uh, contribute to international stability. Thank you very much, uh, Jean-Marc. I think it's very useful always to, to frame these issues. Uh, um, and uh, as we know uh, here at, at GCSP, we, we like to foster this interaction between academics, practitioners, and the, the audience, the participants. So without further ado, I'll uh, now uh, hand the floor to Mr. Andre, Andre Dapkunas from Belarus. Please, sir. Thank you. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this forum for the opportunity to address this attentive audience. I know that the time is short, so I will start with the conclusion. I believe that the small states have a role to play in the current international security situation. Belarus is a medium-sized European country, uh, but in the UN League uh, it belongs uh, to the small states, it actually f formally belongs to the Forum of Small States in New York, an association of uh, countries with population less than 10 million, uh, association ably led by uh, Singapore. And the presence of uh, a Singaporean uh, a colleague is very pertinent in that respect. How we see the current state of international, uh, international state of play, we think that full scale strategic rivalry between the major world powers is re-entering the global scene again, but this time without the semblance of uh, engagement or connectedness that was seen in the yester years. We are continuously told, when talking to our partners from uh, major world powers, we're being told stories of the existing safeguards that will uh, prevent us from uh, falling into the abyss of a full-scale military conflict, yet we have a premonition that those safeguards, even if they exist, they may fail. Uh, we note with uh, great uh, anxiety the continuing uh, and increasing degradation of trust in international relations. This prompts certain actions of, actions of Belarus, some of which you may be aware of, one of the recent things that we are promoting um, an idea, an initiative, or you can call it a concern, um, the idea of um, uh, launching a comprehensive dialogue on uh, Eurasian and Atlantic security. Uh, the idea uh, that we are uh, promoting uh, quite sincerely and honestly 
is being um, ignored, ridiculed, uh, um, uh, misinterpreted. Uh, the actions of Belarus, and I'll be honest, may be seen, uh, the assessment of Belarus may be seen as alarmist, uh, and the actions as awkward, idealistic, naive. We agree to accept all those uh, qualifications as long as uh, the, the, the partners with whom we are talking see deeper the, uh, the reasoning and motivation behind the actions of Belarus. And I would like to lay out very briefly our thinking on why we're doing what we do. We're not doing this for, for publicity for, uh, or, or, or acknowledgement because advocating um, the dialogue that can, is considered by many uh, as impossible or inconvenient at best does not bring you uh, additional popularity points. And uh, it's uh, something that's not easily sold and still we feel obliged to do it uh, for a very simple reason. Belarus, as, and we believe as many small states may or should, is driven by an instinct of self-preservation. Uh, over centuries of our history, being run over dozens of times, in all directions by invading armies, we know uh, the uh, meaning of war. Uh, one of the pervading sentiments in the, in the mentality of Belarusians, uh, uh, embodied in the, in the saying, may there be anybody, may, be, may there be anything but war, is also ridiculed, that Belarus are, Belarusians are so easily putting up with uh, sacrificing things that treasured by others and uh, setting for a very low threshold. Uh, but uh, we, we know uh, quite intimately uh, what kind of suffering the war entails. And so this is why even uh, seven uh, decades after the end of the Second World War, this feeling is very present in the, uh, not just in the, in, 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 in the national psyche, but also in the national decision making. Uh, we don't want to be, really, we don't want to be buried under the fallout of the another destructive grudge between the superpowers which we consider today as the possibility of which we consider as very real. A couple of days ago, uh, in, in the wake of the uh, recent developments on the INF Treaty, the President of Belarus uh, referred to the potential risks for the country uh, uh, from the uh, the deactivation of INF Treaty as a disaster. And when we consider the risk of a nuclear war erupting between the major superpowers, we believe that it's a possibility. This is why we don't care about being awkward, uh, being perceived as awkward, naive, idealistic. We care about our own survival and we feel compelled, either alone or in concert with uh, like-minded parties, to do something that may avert this development. Uh, there's a certain logic, uh, I, I may not rise up to the theoretical uh, level of uh, generalization that was offered by a distinguished colleague, but uh, I feel that there's a certain uh, 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 theoretical logic of uh, action of small states. It starts with a sense of natural vulnerability. And uh, almost uh, b because they are vulnerable, for many reasons that were, were listed, they almost exclusively rely on the uh, multilateral instruments of protection and security. So this is why uh, uh, small states very rarely start wars. And, this is, and s small sta states in uh, far, far larger, to, to a far, far larger extent rely on a law-governed uh, international environment. Uh, this sense uh, of uh, uh, vulnerability, when uh, accepted, this uh, may, may, may lead to a, uh, this uh, acknowledgement of one's vulnerability, uh, may be uh, augmented by the acceptance that it's, it's a fact. We, we, are, we, we are doomed to be small, and we are what we are, and we have to find a way of dealing with it. The next step after acceptance is uh, rallying up courage. The courage to change the things that we can. There are things that small states, regardless of their size, can change. Uh, and we believe that this courage that uh, small states can rally 
and uh, the sense of uh, vested responsibility, they uh, can be uh, very important drivers for their action, like it is, like we see it in, 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 in the case of Belarus. Uh, when we accept our vulnerability, when we add our courage and open up, have this courage to open up and be honest, we have an additional instrument that results in a new ability, probably that uh, is not uh, uh, at the disposal of uh, uh, superpowers, the ability to be more honest, the ability to connect and the ability to build bridges. Uh, over the years I've been, uh, whatever for uh, the, the subject was taken up, I was always mentioning the idea of magnanimity that the big and powerful have this wonderful instrument and then this wonderful privilege to be magnanimous. They don't need to, uh, because of, of, of the fact that they're big, they're, they're self-asserting uh, weight, they don't have to really use it. Um, this uh, uh, concept idea is not uh, bought easily and I believe that contrary to conventional wisdom, magnanimity, if refuted by the big and powerful, can be repossessed by the smaller states who uh, trust in the, in, 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 in the principle and who uh, believe that uh, it, it, it brings um, um, an additional value. What small states can do in that respect when they would like to express their magnanimity? They can create an atmosphere, an environment of moral urgency. Uh, it's not something that, the, the term is not used in, uh, in international, uh, formal international discourse in international organizations, United Nations. We are more used to formal action, to uh, pr uh, uh, proposing certain international instruments, working on them, re uh, sometimes disregarding the, the sentiment, the sentiment that uh, leads to the uh, failed chances of this or that document. I would uh, cite an, an, an example of a, a recent initiative on a nuclear weapons ban treaty that actually uh, isolates all uh, nuclear uh, weapons possessing powers. They, they just uh, are, are out of the scheme. The, the, the large uh, no, um, community of states who believe that nuclear weapons have to be outlawed and there's no way to continue with this, they're doing the right thing, but is at the same time, when isol isolating the powers who have to be engaged, it, they, they bring the, the entire exercise to um, the point of uh, meaninglessness. Uh, how this environment of, um, of moral urgency can be uh, promoted, we believe by speaking up and out, by engaging in what we call a morally charged action. It happened a long while ago, 25 years ago, when Belarus was the first country among the three countries of the former Soviet Union, Belarus, Ukraine and Kazakhstan, who uh, renounced the possession of nuclear weapons they actually had on their territory. An idealistic f f f fact, people uh, again ridiculed that you made a poor choice. Had you had your weapons, you had a far better chance of asserting your influence in the world. We did what did we did and we did, did what in what we believe in. And we believe in the, in, in the power of idealistic things and actions like this. Uh, meaningful political shift in the view of Belarus will not happen if uh, uh, small states, however rightful or uh, convinced, uh, are, if, if they act in isolation uh, in a secluded small states environment. This has to be, the small states, when pursuing a certain uh, uh, goal, have to engage uh, their uh, larger partners. And uh, we have to find the way of doing this and uh, how the different prompts take the initiative, don't jump to take sides, uh, and be a moral force for good. Like uh, the uh, citing the, the the recent developments, the INF uh, treaty situation. The world believes it's be be between Russia and and uh, the United States, but there are also three other parties to the uh, to the treaty, and only one of those, Belarus, actually made a comment on this and. Uh, 
appeal. We're not taking sides. We, 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 we uh, ally with the thinking of our Russian friends uh, on uh, the, the reason on the, on the developments uh, around this treaty. But we appeal to both parties. We believe to both United States and Russia, and citing the example of uh, almost 30 years ago when, Russia, uh, when the USSR and the United States found that uh, requisite moral courage to achieve uh, this agreement, to sign it. So uh, again, things that I'm uh, trying to convey uh, can be easily refuted as idealistic. It's not that the way of working in the real politic world. We pursue this goal. So uh, uh, most of our actions, uh, uh, initiatives are based on, on, on this premise. We are open to suggestions. We don't hold any um, uh, magic formulae. Uh, people may be uh, grilling us on you're speaking about this comprehensive uh, global security dialogue. We are proposing it hold, to hold who will be organizing it. We are open to suggestions. We are open to finding like-minded parties who can share the same goal. Uh, but we are hopeful. We, uh, we are hopeful. We are, we, are, we, are, we are optimists. Optimists in a sense when a pessimist says that it cannot get worse, we believe that it can get worse. But we have also an, an understanding that we can, do, we can do something about it. So the small states, we believe, they matter big. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, uh, you, you, you did uh, point to a very important concepts and keywords that I, I noted down, this, the capacity of initi initiative, of innovation, of change from small states, their role as pot potential mediators, uh, this sense of moral urgency, uh, principled action, engagement, and forceful good. I think this uh, you know, offers a great uh, potential for action. Um, I will now uh, move to uh, Ambassador Lafior, but just before doing so, just to note that uh, I did a little bit of research uh, uh, because Jean-Marc mentioned resources as uh, um, as part of, of power or influence, and of course, Switzerland and Singapore are both very resourceful and rich countries. And it's interesting when you look at the list of countries by GDP per capita, uh, whether um, uh, nominal or uh, purchasing power parity, Switzerland and Singapore come uh, in among the top few countries. And actually, they are only small countries in the top. Uh, the US comes only 11th uh, in two of these lists, and 13th even on the CIA list. It's interesting that you know, the top of the world is made of small countries in, in terms of resources. So without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, and thank you to um, to Belarus for having taken the initiative for this event, and to the GCSP for organising it. Um, the the issue um, in our focus today isn't discussed very often, so I'm really glad to to be here and be um, an active part of it alongside Singapore as well. Um, we've heard a lot already, so um, I will not strive to be exhaustive in my presentation, but rather focus and seek to highlight a set of uh, core considerations. <laughs> and let me maybe start um, by building on, on, on the introduction we heard by Jean-Marc. I, mean, I couldn't agree more and what you just said, Marc. Uh, it's difficult to, to define a small state when, when the, the flyer circulated, I was approached, what, are, are you in a new group of small states and what is a small state? Um, I do agree it's not about um, demography or geography um, or even economic out output. I mean, if you, if you take the, the example of Switzerland, we are very small um, with regard to our population, only 8 million. Um, we are small um, with regard to our territory and even economic output. I mean, we're not a member of the G7, G8, G20, but yet um, we are among the 20 largest um, contributors to the UN um, core budget. So um, it's difficult to define small state. But um, I agree um, we have to approach it in a more qualitative way than quantitative. And I think um, 
what small states do have in common is, and there I, I build on what you just said, um, they cannot rely um, on their might, be it um, economic, um, political, but also military, of course. Um, they have to find another leverage to, to promote their interest um, and, and reach their objectives. Um, and as you already said, um, I think the second element that is really common to all small states is that they have a strong interest in an orderly, stable and peaceful world. And it's pretty clear and evident um, what the reasons are for this. Um, of course, when when it when when um, armed conflict. Um, um, international instability is there and, and um, is rife, uh, small states are definitely or at least more likely to be on the losing end. So um, what, what are the domains um, where small states either play a particular role or plays a particular emphasis on? Um, We've heard it in the introduction. I think small states are particularly well placed um, to act as an intermediary or a mediator between conflicting parties. Um, this is often due to the fact, as we heard, that they are seen as honest brokers um, without a hidden agenda, of course. Um, in the case of Switzerland, this is an area where we've been um, active for a long time. Um, this was true um, during the Cold War, where we could act as a bridge builder between the East and West. But it has been true for the last 20, 30 years as well. Um, we've been acting as a facilitator and provider of host nation services for talks. Um, UN talks regarding Syria, Yemen um, and Libya, as well as various rounds of the Iran nuclear talks. Um, um, just to provide a few examples, and they all took place in Geneva. Um, what is even more interesting, I think, from a small state perspective, is the mediation activities um, that have strongly increased in the last um, recent um, years. Um, Switzerland, more concretely, um, has been involved in about 20 mediation-related processes in recent years, which is quite a few. And this concerns crises and conflicts that um, you see and can um, are covered um, um, by the press, um, such as Ukraine or, or Syria, but also many other contexts. You don't see a lot of headlines for example, Burundi, Myanmar, or the Philippines. Again, just to name a few examples. Um, here again, um, and there I agree, small states have this niche. They can provide special, specific services. And at the same time, it's quite a challenge. Um, we, Despite our experience, we are still expanding and, and need to further professionalize our mediation capacities. Um, it requires an increasing set of expertise. Um, if we want to put it a bit simplistically, um, conflicts are becoming more and more complex and the more you need uh, complex and, and sophisticated expertise um, mediation is a jigsaw um, with many pieces and it's definitely not limited um, to acting as an intermediary between parties. Um, it covers different areas um, such as power and wealth sharing, uh, human rights, social issues, security arrangements, including ceasefire agreements um, with all the specificalities of that area, security sector reforms, and very important and not to be forget, uh, forgotten process design. Um, so the whole thing is um, a complex endeavor and needs a strategic long-term um, view. The second point I wanted to raise is um, the the ability proven by, by small states in rethinking the notion of security. 
um, small states have played an active um, role in the development <coughs> excuse me, of human security. So underlining that human beings must be at the centre um, of our considerations when promoting peace and security. Um, and there again, we have a lot of, 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 of experiences. Um, um, small states were at the forefront also um, in the development of new instru international instruments. The convention um, banning the anti-personal landmines or the convention on cluster munition um, are just few uh, two examples. Um, I think there again, the interest or the specific um, perspective of small states, of combining um, disarmament and humanitarian considerations is, is very, very um, um, specific for small states and, um, yeah, understandable from the lack of military might, etc. Um, the notion of peace of security um, has evolved. Um, and as a small state, as Switzerland, we are convinced that uh, peace and security um, must be extended to human rights and development. And, and we recognize and, and uh, attach great importance to the interlinkages between um, these elements. Um, we think that we are not um, at the end of our journey, um, an integrated approach is needed, we need to do more, and there again I see small states as the driving forces for this. Um, and there I think we can we can link it to your moral, um, what was it, your, your moral urgency. urgency. Um, from a very Swiss perspective, I think Geneva um, has a particular role to play in developing such, such an integrated approach. Um, I think the fact um, of having so many different actors covering disarmament, humanitarian affairs, human rights, migration, peace, uh, development, health, environment, you name them, all together here, um, gives us and puts us in a particular responsibility to do more and do better. Um, and in this context, I think it was very interesting um, to have the UN Secretary General to launch his disarmament agenda last year. I think this disarmament agenda is to be very welcomed because um, it un overcomes these silos. It really um, it, it puts disarmament in the service of prevention, of, of, of peace and security, of conflict prevention um, and the other way around. So um, disarmament is not an end um, in itself anymore. It breaks down silos um, and it shows how disarmament can contribute to achieving the SDGs, for example. Um, and um, um, again, and puts disarmament um, in the context of prevention, which is uh, very much in line with our foreign policy. And last but not least, um, you, Deputy Minister, you mentioned it. I think um, uh, crucial for small states is um, the importance of international rule-based order. Um, an international system based on respect for and compliance with the rule of law is fundamental um, and is a fundamental security safeguard for all states, but particularly and especially for small states. Um, and there I think the historical development um, to see that after World War II um, the establishment um, of the UN Charter based on rules rather than on just on relationships of power constituted a, a, a fundamental development um, again for all states but particularly um, for, for small states. Um, here again, I could um, tell you a lot about Switzerland's active role um, in, in, in promoting and supporting um, the rule-based rule -based processes and multilateral and, and IHL and, and the respect and the promotion of IHL. Um, but again, it's not only um, Switzerland. Let us um, um, think of the MPT. I mean, the MPT 
um, was, let's say, launched by another small state, Ireland, um, with the introduction of their resolution in the UN General Assembly. And then at the end, we came up with the MPT. We have the ATT, where Costa Rica played a, a crucial role, and other small states. So, um, as you say, um, small states um, do have um, a role, not only um, defending their interests, but in the interest of international community in general terms. Um, one thing that concerns me and concerns us as Switzerland and small states currently um, uh, is what we are witnessing and what you alluded to, the challenges um, to this international system based on, on the rule of law. Um, I would say we are witnessing a real crisis in multilateralism. And um, I don't have the answer to that. Um, otherwise, I think I could be candidate for UN Secretary General. But I think um, th that the answer be, must be around that even more so, we need even more multilateralism, we need even more cooperation to face, to face this crisis. Um, to conclude, again, um, so small states um, have proven um, that they do play um, a, a crucial role in the promotion of international peace and security that very often they are more apt and better equipped to play a specific, particular role, um, that they can, or they have in a way the freedom of the, 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 the room for manoeuvre for further developing some concepts, uh, human security as an example, and at the same time um, that they do benefit from the rule-based international order, but they also um, strongly contribute to it. I stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you for focusing on this aspect of the power of small states in mediating, uh, which implies, of course, not necessarily taking sides, but is compatible with promotion of values, not like multilateralism, human rights, human Security. And now I'm pleased to hand over to Ambassador. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, it's, it's tough to speak to a crowd after lunch, and it's tougher to speak to a crowd after three very good speakers, but I'll try. Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for inviting us, uh, Singapore, to this uh, particular forum. And this is a very important topic for us. Uh, and this is because I think half of the UN membership, they actually consist of small countries or small states. Now, today's topic is about the role of small states in the maintenance of international peace and security. But I'm not here to lionize the role of small countries or small states. Because the harsh fact of the matter is that size do matter in international relations. Um, and small states do not perform any fundamentally irreplaceable role in the international system. So therefore, the only viable strategic response for small states is to seek the maximum number of friends while maintaining their freedom of action as a sovereign nation. And small countries can only do that uh, by making themselves relevant to the international community so that other countries have an interest in their continued survival and prosperity. But what do I mean by relevance? Uh, relevance uh, economic, political, or strategic relevance, in our view, uh, must be created by human endeavour. And once created, uh, it must be sustained uh, by human endeavour. Uh, but does this mean that small countries and small states will forever be uh, condemned to be international political price takers? On the contrary, Singapore's view is that it is precisely because we are small, therefore we must do whatever it takes to protect our sovereignty, maintain our relevance, and to create the political and economic space for us to react. Um, like uh, uh, our distinguished uh, colleague from Belarus has said, we have to stand up, to speak up, and to speak out uh, for our ideals and principles, and to preserve the international rules-based multilateralism and rule of law. 
Uh, I want to take this chance to take the conversation in a slightly different direction and tell you two stories to illustrate uh, what uh, I mean and uh, what Singapore has done. And this couple of examples might not be too familiar with our friends in Europe, but I will try. The first story is about the Cambodian conflict. Uh, in December 1978, uh, Vietnam invaded uh, Cambodia. And this happened at the height of the Cold War. And uh, this invasion was you know, regarded by many as a proxy Sino-Soviet uh, proxy war. The issue for Singapore about uh, Vietnam's invasion of Cambodia and the disposition of a legitimate government by an external force and the imposition of a proxy government by a foreign power is to us a clear violation of international law and an act of external uh, aggression. So we decided we have to respond, even as a small country. Because if left unopposed, uh, this would have established an undesirable precedent in international relations and pose rather serious implications for our own security in our region. So what did Singapore do? Well, the first thing, the first thing that we did uh, was to ensure that our regional group, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, maintained a united position. And ASEAN's core objectives at that time were threefold. Number one, to prevent the Vietnamese occupation of Cambodia from becoming a fait accompli. Number two, hopefully to persuade Vietnam back to the negotiating table. And number three, eventually ensure a peaceful negotiated outcome that will allow the Cambodian people the right to self-determination and independence. Now to achieve these objectives, Singapore played a very active role in a pretty long diplomatic campaign that lasted more than 10 years actually. Uh, from 1978, right up to the signing of the Paris Peace Agreement in 1991 that signaled the end of the conflict. Um, there are many parts of the campaign, but I'll just focus on one part, just to give you a sense of, uh, from a practitioner's point of view, what actually we did. Our diplomatic campaign of, on, on this Cambodian issue at the United Nations focused on basically denying Vietnam the opportunity to claim Cambodia's seat at the UN. Uh, with intense lobbying, we pushed through the ASEAN resolution at the UN General Assembly in support of Cambodia year after year with increasing majorities. Our goal was to keep this issue in the international consciousness and to persuade Vietnam, as I said, eventually to come to the negotiating table. Just a sense of the kind of lobbying um, activities that we did. Uh, we not only hosted the usual uh, ASEAN receptions, you know, diplomatic receptions, uh, on the sidelines of the annual General Assembly. Now, you might think that receptions are, you know, uh, where people have a good time, but we, we do not, you know, we use these receptions as a chance uh, to reach out to countries that we don't, from different parts of the world, to raise their consciousness about this issue so that they can support us. But beyond these diplomatic uh, receptions and dinners and uh, to, to reach out to different groups, Singaporean and, and ASEAN diplomats, we also physically traveled to capitals all over the world uh, just to touch base to get a better reading of the countries that could be persuaded to switch their positions to us. We customized information pamphlets and booklets to counter the rhetoric and the arguments from the other side. And uh, these pamphlets, uh, blue and red in color, became so effective that they were described by some parties as the purple pros of Singapore diplomacy for their hard-hitting arguments. When it came down to voting on the floor in the UN, um, if sometimes if our diplomats see that a friendly delegation, their seat is empty, they will actually go searching you know, for the delegates, even as far as the toilets, to make sure that they come back in time to vote for us. So every vote counts. So you're asking what did all this achieve? Well, I mentioned early on that the Cambodian issue was essentially a Sino-Soviet proxy conflict. And we are realistic enough to know that it is beyond the powers of Singapore and even ASEAN uh, to resolve this. What Singapore and ASEAN could do was to prevent the fiat comply. And when the constellation of major powers shifted, a diplomatic solution could be found. So eventually, the permanent five members of the Security Council decided to get directly involved um, in the Cambodian conflict in 1990, and these efforts actually resulted uh, in the Paris uh, Peace Agreement in 1991. The second story I wanted to illustrate is on East Timor, or Timor-Leste as it is known today. Uh, East Timor was occupied by Indonesia in 1975, and uh, this Indonesian occupation was characterized by a decades-long uh, conflict between the local separatist groups and the Indonesian military. 
Uh, but in 1999, uh, at that time, the president, Indonesian president, B.J. Habibie, uh, decided to grant uh, East Timor a referendum on independence. Now, the UN-sponsored referendum, I'm providing some context so that you can understand what I'm um, going to say next, uh, on the 30th of August, 1999, and showed an overwhelming majority of the Timorese people wanted independence. Uh, but what happened after that was uh, quite tragic. Uh, after the results were announced, um, Violent clashes, uh, suspected to be instigated by anti-independence militias, uh, broke out. Uh, many Timorese citizens were killed. Homes and businesses were burnt down. Even the ICRC's officers were burnt down. And more than one quarter of a million people were actually displaced by the violence. Now, those in the UN system and practitioners, you know that it takes time to mount a UN peacekeeping operation. While this killing was continuing and burning was continuing, and given the scale of the violence, so what happened? Well, what happened was that Aust Australia uh, sought the support of the Secretary General at that time, the late Mr. Kofi Annan, for an Australian-led international peacekeeping force uh, to enter East Timor to stop the violence. Uh, the Security Council later passed a resolution called 1264, uh, calling for a multinational force called INTERFET. You know, it's an acronym for the International Force of East Timor to restore peace and stability in East Timor, to protect the UN officers in East Timor, until a time when a proper UN peacekeeping force could be approved and deployed. Uh, so Interfet, uh, this international force, started deploying on the 20th of September, just two or three weeks after the violence started. Uh, Singapore, uh, we participated in Interfet in response to calls uh, by Australia, the UN and Indonesia. And we are one of the 22 uh, countries of Interfet. And we are among the first on the ground. And some of you might be wondering, you know, what's so great deal about Singapore participating in this thing? For those who know us as Singapore well, we do not have a large professional standing army. In fact, we are a conscript army. All Singaporean men, uh, uh, we have to serve two years of compulsory military service and in the reserves uh, thereafter. But despite our posture, our initial contribution was a 370 strong contingent comprising uh, members of the Singapore Armed Forces, uh, medical de uh, detachment logistics. We contributed a Charlie 130 and three landing ship tanks. And when the responsibility of the security for East Timor transferred from Interfet uh, uh, to the UN Transitional Administration for East Timor, we continued to support it uh, by deploying it up to a company of combat peacekeepers and many other contributions. Now, why did we do that? Well, we decided to participate in the FED because um, East Timor is in our region, and what happens there has an impact on our own security and our own country. The, the main point, I'm highlighting these two examples, Cambodia as well as East Timor, is that, and I, this is the point I want to make, is that while we are aware, as a small country, there's a limit to what small states can do on our own, to shape the course of events internationally, we are not entirely powerless, you know, and we can work with like-minded countries to enhance international peace and security. And over the past two years, Singapore has continued to contribute assets as well as manpower uh, to various UN missions around the world. I'll give you an example, a few examples. Um, well, Singapore, we have participated in and even periodically commanded this multinational combined task force 151 as part of the international counter-piracy efforts in the Gulf of Eden uh, to keep the strategic waterway safe from piracy. And this is because, why? Because Singapore, we are a maritime nation and we cannot protect every ship, but we can work with others to make sure that there's inter international peace and security on the international waterways. We have been participating in the international humanitarian o uh, operations since 1970, and as well as contributed to the multinational reconstruction efforts in Afghanistan and Iraq. Since 2014, we have contributed assets and personnel to the Defeat ISIS, ISIS coalition. And these contributions include uh, refueling tanker aircraft, medical teams, analysts, combat tactical tra trainers, uh, etc. We go beyond our borders, collaborate with international partners again, to counter terrorism at source, so as to stop the spread of you know, terrorism. Uh, so where do we go from here? And I'll be ending quite soon. Uh, I think we have heard from the previous speakers that 
there's now a sense that multilateralism is at a crossroads, or even crisis, as what uh, Sabrina has said. I think we're transitioning into a multipolar world, but it is an asymmetrical multipolar world, and I think the US will still be one of the strongest, if not the strongest pole in this uh, re uh, reconfiguration. And this is a transition that needs to be managed, in our view, very carefully and very delicately by small countries. I think there's also an increasing anxiety over unilateralism, that we will go back to a world where the big and strong impose their will, and the only option for small countries is to become proxy states. So I agree with Sabrina and our speakers before, uh, before that, that actually we think there's a very strong case to be made to actually double down on multilateralism rather than retreating from it. We need to make multilateralism work in this shifting geopolitical uh, context. And more than ever, we need a clear framework of rules and norms to ensure predictability, stability in interstate relations and commerce. And compliance of agreed rules by all states, big and small, is essential not just for global stability, but also for the governing of global commons. The principle of agreements, uh, signed agreements, must be respected and must be implemented, and this is fundamental for the survival of small countries. And defining these rules and norms in multilateral processes in the UN or other places, in which all countries and states engage each other as equals, is essential to build consensus and to strengthen respect for the rule of law. I think um, I'll end by saying that the strategic imperative has never been greater for small states to work together and to work with medium-sized and big countries to preserve rules-based multilateralism and the rule of law so that we do not end up in a world whereby the strong do what they will and the weak suffer what they must. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Du, for um, highlighting actually what could be a uh, second motto of GCSP. Uh, if you can't fight the problem, uh, you can shape the solution. And this is what uh, small states very often have the capacity of doing, uh, as we can see. And obviously, the, the best way of achieving this is through a rules-based uh, multilateral order.